Good evening and welcome to Earth Day 2021, presented by the Revolutionary Poets Brigade with Native Poets of California and Poets of the Revolutionary Poets Brigade. I'm John Curl. Our special guests tonight are poets from this wonderful anthology, Red Indian Road West, edited by Lucia Lang Day and Kurt Schweigman and published by Scarlett Tanager Books. It's available in the usual places online and in community bookstores. On Earth Day, in this time of great crisis, we're bringing together the visions and ideas of Native people with the visions and ideas of the traditions of social revolution. And what better way to do that than through poetry, through culture, because in essence, this is a cultural struggle. We're all in together with the fate of the planet and humanity at stake. Lucille Lang Day will be the MC for the first part of the program with the native poets and I will return to MC the second half with poets of the Revolutionary Poets Brigade. Red Indian Road West co-editor Lucille Lang Day has published 11 poetry collections, including Birds of San Pablo and Other Poems of Place and Becoming an Ancestor. She has also co-edited Fire and Rain, Echo Poetry of California, and is the author of two children's books and a memoir. Her many honors include the Joseph Henry Jackson Award, the Blue Light Poetry Prize, two Penn Oakland Josephine Miles Literary Awards, including one for Red Indian Road West and 11 Pushcart Prize nominations. The founder and director of Scarlet Tanager Books, she is of Wampanoag, British and Swiss German descent, Lucille Lang Day. Thank you. Wuni Nakan Kudapudish for being with us tonight. That's um, good evening. And I thank you for being with us tonight in Wampanoag. Uh, I'm going to start out with a land acknowledgement. Our reading tonight in the San Francisco Bay Area is on land where the Ohlone family of tribes lived for more than 10,000 years before the arrival of Europeans. Those of us in the East Bay are reading on Chochenyo Ohlone land, and those in San Francisco are on Muwekma Ohlone land. The Ohlone people are still here, and the Muwekmas are now seeking federal recognition for their tribe. Uh, poet Stephen Meadows, who's reading with us tonight, is of Ohlone descent. And I wish to thank the Ohlone's for their long stewardship of this land and also acknowledge that they never ceded it to the U.S. So all of the Indigenous people reading with us tonight are contributors to Red Indian Road West. Uh, with more than 750,000 residents who identify as Native American, California has the largest Native American population of any state in the U.S. Uh, this includes people from more than 100 existing California tribes, and it also includes individuals and families from tribes nationwide who relocated to California. Uh, Red Indian Road West is the first poetry anthology. I'll hold it up again to bring um, all of these particular groups together. And I think that a reading of the contributors is an excellent way to celebrate Earth Day. So I'm going to start out by reading two of my own poems. And the first one I'll read is from Red Indian Road West. And it's called At Lake Tahoe. 
Granite mountains dense with white firs, lodgepole pines, and ponderosas rise abruptly from the lake's blue bowl so deep its waters could cover all of California and Nevada. The Washoes, who lived here 10,000 summers, named it Lake in the Sky because it reflected clouds, sunset, and stars. They caught Lahontan trout in the lake, mountain whitefish in icy streams. On the other side of the continent, my Wampanoag ancestors were gathering cranberries, covering their summer homes with cattail mats, baking clams, drying corn, and fishing for salmon off Cape Cod. The Washoes used only fallen trees for homes they would dismantle before leaving Lake in the Sky each winter. In fall, they gathered pinion pine nuts to eat until spring. This was before white people came and cut down the pinion pines to build their houses, dynamited the mountains in search of silver and gold and claimed the fish. Now a paddle boat with three decks takes tourists on cruises of Lake Tahoe. Yet in summer, Washoes still do the pine nut dance and Wampanoags do the grass dance to keep the world in balance and remind us that the earth is living. Every rock is sacred and every tree and salmon has a soul. And next, I will read um, a poem from my new collection, Birds of San Pancho and Other Poems of Place. And this one is called Names of the States. Alabama, for the Alabama tribe forced from Alabama to Texas when white people claimed their land in 1805. Alaska, for the Aleut word Alyeska, meaning mainland, the place toward which the sea flows. Arizona, the word for small spring in the Awadam language of a Southwest desert people who couldn't vote until 1948. Arkansas, another name for the Quapaws, the downstream people who were removed to Oklahoma from their ancestral lands. Connecticut, from the Algonquian word for long river place. Delaware, from Baron de la War, Virginia's first governor, whose name rechristened the local Lenny Lenape, the first tribe to sign a treaty with the US. Hawaii, for Hawaii Loa, discoverer of the islands in Polynesian myth. Idaho, maybe Shoshone, for the sun comes down the mountain, or the Apache name for the Comanches who drove them from the Southern Plains. Illinois, a French transliteration of Alinwi and the Ojibwe word for the Anoka whose 13 tribes were reduced to five by European disease. Indiana, land of the Indians, the Delaware, Piankashaw, Kickapoo, Wea, Shawnee, Miami and Potawatomi, who were mostly removed by 1846. Iowa, from the Dakota name for the Iowa tribe, meaning sleepy ones. Kansas, the Dakota word for the South Wind people, whose last fluent speaker of the Kansa language died in 1983. Kentucky, from the Iroquoian word for on the meadow, Massachusetts, people of the Great Hills, that is the Blue Hills south of Boston Harbor, who were decimated by smallpox in 1633. Michigan, from Michigamaa, great water in the language of the Ojibwe, who like so many others didn't understand the treaties ceding their land. Minnesota, from Minnesota, the name the Dakotas gave the Minnesota River, whose clear blue water reflected clouds. 
Mississippi, from Mississippi, Ojibwe for the great river, along which more than 20 tribes lived and fished. Missouri, for the Missouri tribe that lived on the Missouri River, a Siouan people whose name means town of the big canoes. Nebraska, from Nebraska, the Omaha word for broad water, a description of the Platte River by which the tribe lived. New Mexico, named for the Mexicas, a Nahuatl speaking people who ruled the Aztec empire until the Spanish conquered them in 1519. North and South Dakota, named for a Sioux tribe whose name, whose men were sentenced in 1862 to the largest mass execution in US history, though Dakota means friend. Ohio, from Ohio, continuously giving river in the language of the Senecas, whose land was flooded in 1965 following construction of Kanzua Dam. Oklahoma, from Oklahoma, Choctaw for red people, a name proposed by the chief of the Choctaw Nation during treaty negotiations in 1866. Oregon, maybe from Oregon, an Algonquian word for beautiful river, but so many native words and languages have been lost that it's hard to say. Tennessee, for the Cherokee town, Tennessee, a village on the Little Tennessee River until the Cherokees were marched to Oklahoma along the Trail of Tears. Texas, meaning friends or allies in the language of the Caddo's who were removed to Oklahoma in 1859. Utah, from Utahi, an Apache word meaning people of the mountains. Wisconsin, from Wisconsin, the name for the Wisconsin River in the Miami language, river running through a red place. Wyoming, a contraction of Mechiwiameing, a Delaware word first used for a valley in Pennsylvania, meaning at the big plains. And yes, every part of this land is Indian country, from forest to desert, mountain to prairie, Manhattan to Yosemite, Tallahassee to Seattle, all the fields, rivers, hills, and canyons between the two shining seas. So that's, uh, that's where the names of most of uh, the states in the US came from. Um, our next reader uh, will be Dave Holt. Dave was born in Toronto of Irish, English, and Ojibwe ancestry, and he moved to California as an aspiring songwriter. Also a musician and composer, he and his wife, Chapel, collaborate on composing, recording, and mixed poetry song performances. His poetry has won several prizes, including a Literary Cultural Arts Award for his book, Voyages to Ancestral Islands, which tells the story of reuniting with his Anishinaabe Ojibwe ancestors. His work is included in several anthologies, such as Red Indian Road West and Descanso's Words from the Wayside, where his poem received a Pushcart Prize nomination. So welcome, Dave. Thank you. Ani Kinawea. Hello, everyone. From atop Kirker Pass, where cars travel closer to clouds, a vista of remembered joy as we drag wounded bodies, broken hearts through a panorama, making brokenness beautiful. Nature, too, with wounds. Quarry torn from Mount Zion's side, refineries belching waste into Sacramento River, freeways like great long scars through the valley, reckless collisions bleed in every direction wildfires on our horizon. Butterfly sanctuaries invaded by armored Humvees, desert creatures endangered by a reckless border wall, 
Many face extinction, just as we coal mine canaries do. Watching from higher ground, wondering how. Can we heal erosions, climate change and firestorms? Pollutions that mirror like a bad parable the destruction of America's political ideals and freedoms. Part two, uprising. <clears throat> Share a glimpse with me into paved over earth. What thrives invisible below concrete? Where tree roots whisper saving knowledge to each other. Where mother trees nurture the seedlings, signal warnings to kin. Sing forest spirits back into the sacred circle. Listen closely. They are mobilizing to sue for damages to take back the land. <clears throat> Here's my acknowledgement of territory. A path to healing depends on the acknowledgement of the original people before us who loved and cared for the land were dispossessed of it. On the huge 17,921 acre rancho Monte del Diablo, land where my family lives today, the indigenous natives were Bay Miwok, the Chupcan. Don Salvio Pacheco, resident of Pueblo San Jose, where he served as a senior civil servant, was a retired militiaman who served under Lieutenant Colonel Juan Batista Dianza discoverer of the mission sites, San Francisco, San Jose. Pacheco was in an advantageous position to petition the Mexican government for lands in the valley where the city of Concord now exists. He received his grant in 1834. The California Indian, a peripheral participant whose labor was exploited was paid with a share of the crops raised and meat slaughtered, just like in old world feudalism. Our house was built in 1972 on the southern edge of the old Monte del Diablo ranch, Rancho granted to Pacheco in 1834. <clears throat> this tree lives on the rancho. Ancient oak tree witness Hey, old oak, bent low, partly broken, survivor of shatter of lightning, battering hammer wind, I want to be like you. Plant my feet so firm, no blast could knock me down. Maybe you don't stand so straight now, 200-year-old tough bark being. Leaves like green eyes see everything. Saw every cruel wind that swept native people off the land, land where I now live. Bay Miwok Chupkan of this rancho, who'd nurtured, cultivated, harvested meadows of brodia, wild onions, rye, fescue, river banks of willow, oak acorn groves, for millennia, before such a thing as land grants were heard of. You, oak watcher and listener, heard the crying out of grasses, corms, food plants, at each blow of cattle hoof and herd, you, nature's witness, to the injustice of Mexico's land grants. To cattle barons like Salvio Pacheco of Concord, his new industries of leather and beef cow, who enforced the support of native serfs recast in medieval European mold. Hey, old oak, bent low, vision dimmed, you can still tell your story. I will listen and try not to weep. <clears throat> this one is modern Miwok man, a man of our time. Jackrabbit sprints up the hill following a track in the grass. He who found Rabbit's trail, modern Miwok man, thought it was a deer path, hunts with a rifle now, follows a jog in his memory, guided by a rabbit. Stories lodged in the collective unconscious of a village on Cerro Alto de las Bobones, high hill of the Volvon tribe. His Chupcan Miwok ancestors would visit before the days marked by European time, 1775, 
when Captain Juan de Ayala sailed in through Boca del Puerto to San Francisco, what Fremont later named the Golden Gate, Chrysopoli, even before there was gold and a quest for holy dust that drove men mad, unaware that a city of harvest gatherers and hunters dwelt in a remote mountain fastness as they'd lived for millennia, over 60 homes, preparing food from over 700 bedrock mortars. We followed the rhythm of time as we knew it, says modern Miwok man, but time is a thief. Volvon Miwok City long deserted. Spanish Franciscan friars and their soldados took us away. We escaped. Troops followed us back, cursed our religion, reviled our medicine men, renamed sacred mountain Ojampile after K. Cabran El Diablo, abducted us to missions where we learned new ways to survive, to play new kinds of music, notes scratched on a page, new rituals from a book they said was holy. We raised cattle for the Spaniard and the gringo. The smallpox took most of us. Modern Miwok man now follows the call of his work, a steward of the environment, using knowledge of his tribe's traditional ecology to restore streams, native plants, new scientific methods to reverse the pollutions of Earth Mother. He goes on. History says we lived under six flags in this state of California, an amusement park joke, many more than that, but no flag raised to honor our Bay Miwok Volvon people once a nation still here to protect the land. Waking early, my last one. From lowlands to high hills, a long sigh of night wind, little rain, no fires, Earth Mother rocks the cradle, breathes a rhythm into a song, her embrace restoring the dark world. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Dave. That was wonderful. Um, our next reader is Allison Hart. Allison identifies as a mixed race, Black, Irish, Scottish, English, and Passamaquoddy Native American woman of color. Uh, Award-winning and best-selling author Isabel de Allende praised Allison's novel, Mostly White, as so compelling it gave me goosebumps. Allison is also the author of a poetry collection, Temp Words from Cosmo Press, and her play, Mother Daughter Dance, was produced by a black box theater in San Francisco. She is passionate about creating work that informs the reader about American history from the perspectives of mar marginalized and forgotten voices. She is a writer, musician, mother, and music educator. Welcome, Allison. Wally Wan, thank you so much, Lucy and John and Annette to inviting me here and, and everybody here. It's quite an honor. I wanna just give thanks to the Ohlone people, the land that I'm on in Alameda. Um, Kichin U.S., Wally Wan, great spirit, thank you. Kwe Tankak, hello, how are you? Skajin Wuku, my, my red relatives and all my relations. I'm gonna start with the poem from uh, the anthology. And this is in the honor of my brother who passed away in, when he was 29 years old in 1996. It's called Apparition. Walking to my brother's grave, past farmhouses, snowy fields, I step into spirit land. Are they resting? I look for the bench. We love you, mommy, not Scots. Recognize the open fields, 
when we sprinkled his ashes into a square hole in the earth, trying to joke, saying he'd rather like a circle. Placing my hair, I cut for him the last of him dust back to the earth with all these moaning spirits. I find the bench, tears fall as I dig up the snow, revealing damp earth and find his name. 1967 to 1996, so definite, so factual, his life and death entombed under a tree. I light sage on the cement plaque, praying to great spirit, to the ancestors. I don't ask for anything, but the wind to take my smoke prayers and peace for him, and for him to know I love him wherever he is. Kneeling in the snow, sage smoke rising, faint wind blows, I empty my thoughts. Peace swirls around me. I break off a twig of berries and place it on his plaque. Kiss my finger, place it on his name. I know he isn't there that he has become the sky itself smiling down on me. To my brother, Scott. Oh, thank you. I still can't get used to these Zoom readings, you know? It feels so flat, but I can, you know, see you. <laughs> okay, next. This is from my poetry book, Temp Words. And it's called Enough enough earth. I wrote it for my son and he's uh, 21 now. Enough earth. Is there enough earth to hold all our dreams or is time running out as glaciers melt and carbon rises? Is there enough earth to hold all of our dreams or our slides, quakes, tsunamis, fires, triggering, Flight, fright, freeze, lower brain stems, activate, ready to run. Is there enough earth for all our dreams? Or did this generation use it up feeding banks while children's mouths hang open? Is there enough earth to hold all of our, our dreams or do they only exist at night? Causing no waste, no heavy steps, no need to worry about tomorrow or the next 10 years when climate change is irreversible. Is there enough earth to hold all of our dreams? If, if I could, I would hold yours in my hand, little one, tell you not to worry, go run, go play. I'm holding it, holding it for you. For my son, Luis. Thank you, and this is the last one. I wrote it today. I heard about the killing of Mario Gonzalez in Alameda uh, under police custody. And this is dedicated to him and his family. We are under siege in this country, on this earth. We know it in our bones, holding our breath when loved ones drive, walk, sleep, jog, dance, one hand on our heart, the other tending to our lives until another police murder erupts. We send secret safety bubbles to children, wives, husbands, daughters, sons, mothers, fathers, cousins, friends. No, not them. No, not today. Five minutes from my home in Alameda, a 26 year old man died in police custody. Died is too passive. What did they do? What force did they use? Where are the body cam videos? How come the mother wasn't allowed to see her son in the hospital until they wheeled him out lifeless? So few get justice. We are under siege and I can't take my hand off my heart to reach yours until something is done. Wally one, thank you, all my relations. Um, Lucy, Lucy, you have to unmute. 
Yeah, I put, <laughs> sorry about that, but but thank you, Allison. Those those poems were were great. Um, and the and the uh, the the last one um, is both very very moving and very disturbing. So next um, we have Stephen Meadows. Steve is a Californian of pioneer and Ohlone descent. He has earned degrees from UC Santa Cruz and San Francisco State University. Yay. And his poems have appeared in anthologies and journals nationwide, and one of them graces a bronze plaque in San Francisco. He has devoted much of his life to poetry in an attempt to honor his ancestors and the beauty of the natural world. He is a veteran of public radio, where he has interviewed scores of musicians and visionaries from the British Isles to North America. He has done all kinds of work to keep the poems coming and his poetry collection, Releasing the Days was published by Heyday. Welcome, Steve. Okay. Um, my first poem is, uh, is called The Burial. A scene one remembers from a night full of dreams. The wet pit disguised by a square of green cloth. Here and there small birds forage in the grass, pecking to and fro for each sad urgency. Beyond the white sand hills comes the hard boom of the ripped surf clubbing winter beach. Small fists of relatives chat soft among the markers, relieved it is over. They are patterned like beads about the nondescript stones and the casket incidental in the cold. Nevada. Out here the bruised mountains and a sun falling fast. Just the sound of those trucks on the highway these yellow leaves sheltering, and the moon, a frail disk that has risen half a purple world away. Snow nearing Elko. The belly of the valley into jubilant distance, cold crested ranges be calmed by these flakes. Up ahead the horizon, the stained ruby mountains, the sagebrush, the gone trees, the stark flanks of foothills, the winded last light and this pinwheeling whiteness, this freedom overtaken by the dark. In the bottoms. This was a poem uh, I wrote uh, for my wife, Carly, who has uh, wonderfully made my appearance here possible. In the bottoms. Down in the willows, the sound of a saxophone meanders on a slight wind up across the fields. The tentative sad notes blown slowly over water, a blues that hits home this night with you away. The country all around bereft of reasons and of thought my own sense sifted through that blue sax under the black skies. Quietly out of the way for Richard Brodigan. At first light remorse, an ache in the room, the urge to weep and with reason enough, and yet the knowledge that by day's end, enough wine, all will be well again. Those ones on the corner by the park, those ones in the weeds, as Brodigan said once, drinking quietly out of the way, the world too much, too vacant, and nothing for the pain. Eucalyptus, 
torn orange bark limbs littering the road. We walk, the boy asking about the trees, their medicinal smell. I tell him of past days when I slept in old trucks and the grove sent me down enough branches for a fire every night. Sycamore. Outside the snow falls around the sycamore trees, the street so quiet the baby sings to himself and sleeps in his warm bed safe and unafraid. The yard growing white under the gaunt wooden limbs that are hands reaching up out of the cold soil, imploring us to live. I, um, I have one more poem here. Uh, I was asked by Kurt Schweigman if, he, if I would read one of his, and I'm reading Marin Coast for Lucy. We hiked to the ocean today, left a prayer for earth where land and sea hug each other. It was better than good, maybe even gooder than better. We reminisced her toddler memories Sun melted my worries away. Plants, rocks, trees, sky, kept us both in the moment, beaming smiles as prayer and earth do feel the simplest love of a father and young daughter who hold hands while hiking. It's really a great honor to be here and I thank all of you from the bottom of my heart. Thank you too, Steve. That was really beautiful. And next uh, we have Nanette Dietz. Nanette is Dakota and Lakota, originally from Crow Creek, South Dakota. She's also a Cherokee descendant from the Cherokee Nation of Oklahoma on her mother's side and German American on her father's side. She holds a BA and MA from UCLA in theater arts and dance, and a second MA in counseling psychology. Her poetry has been published in numerous magazines and anthologies, and she's co-coordinator of the Alameda Island Poets. And in 2019, the, the 17th annual Berkeley Poetry Festival honored her with its Lifetime Achievement Award for Poetry and Activism. And she is a journalist for Indian Country Today and Native News Online. Welcome, Nanette. Thank you, Lucy. It's an honor to be here. I just want to say, Tomi takoye, shante washtea nape chiyusupele. Uh, and Osio, <laughs> Dagodo Naneti, Alameda Chinsala. Um, hello, my relatives. Um, from my heart, I say, well, I, I welcome you with a good heart. That's what I said in Lakota. And um, I, I'd like to honor the Ohlone people also on the land that we're standing on and living on right now before I begin my poetry. Um, I'm one of those displaced ones that are here in California. And I'd like to read my first poem is a poem that I wrote in honor of my mother's father, my grandfather, who passed in 1976. And I think of my relatives often now, since most of them have passed on. And this is in his honor. In memory of Kenneth James Bradley, Iron Eagle, who took his spirit walk March 24, 1976. Wo o kiksuye, Kenneth James Bradley, Iron Eagle. Wanagi o mani kage, March 24, 1976. I live on an island now, surrounded by the sounds of water. Songbirds, red tail hawk, blue heron, egret, blue jay, and crow. Here is where I deny urban reality this new world. My relatives taught me early the trick to Indian survival, how to make the square a circle, how to make concrete, cars, and pain 
disappear. They taught us how to look at our land and see it as it was 529 years ago. They taught us to remember the season when choked cherries ripen, to remember the stars and the star people, to remember the gift of knowledge passed through stories and memories, and to remember to sing and dance, sing and dance, sing and dance. Mixed race woman, mixed race man caught in the gauze between two worlds, our mind and senses the only means of escape. But scar tissue lays thick and deep. Too many broken promises, broken treaties, broken hearts. Old ones, young ones taken away or leaving us behind. But that has made our eyes weak, but our hearts sharp and clear. Our hearts sharp and clear. Deer, wolf, moto, bear, tatanka, buffalo. This next poem that I wrote, um, I wrote it when I went to Standing Rock and I was there for only about two weeks. And with the passing recently of LaDonna Brave Bull Allard, I thought I would read this poem in her honor and all of the uh, folks that were there that stayed and came from all over the world. It was a beautiful, beautiful thing to see. Uh, it truly was. We are our ancestors' wildest dreams. Maniwichoni, water is life. Sacred water used as a weapon. They turned their dogs on us, chemical weapons, bullets once again. Still like a river we flowed until we gathered together at Standing Rock. Coming home through generations of displacement, loss of family, land, language, traditions, so many lost. Yet we heard the song and we traveled, followed the drum by plane, by car, by bus. Some walked, some ran. We are our ancestors' wildest dreams. While campfires burned, coyotes sang as we touched the stars. Morning sun and Inipi changes from pink to mauve, purple, then yellow, until furious light shines through smoke from many hearts. Horses roam freely. Buffalo visit once again, and children laugh. We are our ancestors' wildest dreams. Many blessings to a full circle of relatives. And this last poem I'll read is something that I recently wrote for uh, the Chochenyo people of Lishan here in Alameda, we finally <laughs> managed to change the name of a park from the Andrew Jackson Park to Chochenyo Park. So we're very, very happy that that happened. But big, big changes and big thanks out to Corinna Gould and all of the folks that she's, everything she's been doing forever, it seems like. I call it Night Song. Sometimes late at night, the wind carries their voices along Mound Street. From the edge of the bay over trillions of shell shards that mark the detritus of their lives. Shell stories, shell songs sung from deep in the womb. Chochenyo voices push up through concrete and asphalt, through centuries of quilt squares, 
sewn over round houses and basket hats, yet never completely silencing their presence. On nights when the moon hangs low in the sky, stars arrange themselves in intricate patterns like the deer dance. I wake to a song. It is peaceful in its melody and sings of 5,000 years of continual peace on this one area, small piece of land around the San Francisco Bay. This song reminds us that at one time skies here were black with birds. Flowers and trees so thick we could smell fragrance on cross winds before we saw them shimmering through early morning mist. Turtle Island is a gentle land where peaceful people lived. And that is the nature of those living Chochenyo voices, bones, villages of redwood stick that resemble the Inipi. Chochenyo voices are brilliant light, guiding us, helping us all find our way around places still dark, dangerous, foreboding. Their voices sing, speak, play the clapping sticks and remind us to stand as a beacon of peace in a world seemingly, but not completely, gone mad. Again, many blessings. And thank you. It's an honor to be here and to read with all of you. Thank you so much, Nanette. So next we have Linda Noel. Linda is of Koyun Kawi or Konkau descent and grew up in Mendocino County. She's cur she currently resides in Ukiah, California where she is Poet Laureate Emerita. She is the author of a chapbook where you first saw the eyes of Coyote and has been nominated for a Pushcart Prize. One of her poems is included in the permanent exhibit at the Museum of the West, and another was adapted and put to music by the Pasadena Choir. Her work has been included in many anthologies, such as When the Light of the World Was Subdued, Our Songs Came Through, uh, Tending the Fire, and The Dirt is Red Here. Welcome, Linda. And you need to unmute yourself. Gee, I was just talking away. Good to see everybody. <laughs> okay, sorry about that. Navarro and the beauty of the river and the moon and the moon on the river and the ridge and the naked bones of trees reflecting the motionless low tide where the river lips muddy and smooth welcome the meeting of the river and the sea and the ridge and the river and the moon and the river and the ridge and the moon and twilight on the reaching cape of ocean smooth on the wind folding in and out a place where Pomo people travel west to the edge for renewal, for nourishment, for relief, for belief. Because I grew up in Mendocino County, a lot of people think I uh, am Pomo. And um, part of it is, is because I know some Pomo stories because I was with a Pomo man for many years. <clears throat> Pardon me. But my people come from the Northern Sierra. Salmon flesh beneath moon, a feast is near. That fish in night sky going up river, heading home, this acorn time names his journey, calls him back to beginnings, called back to a soft circle belly, flaming red fire, flesh feeding an October night flight of fish across a frozen sky with skin of stars. I have seen that same star colored salmon flickering in another river, not named Sky, but not far from here. 
Several nights back, I stopped at that river and moon gave streaks cut by fish splitting a silver ribbon of water, which was on that particular night, a lean woman body swaying and dancing the river motion beneath moon. Dawn cracking. Oh, salmon heart, your fin flutters to the ticking of the season. Oh, heart of earth, where is the start of the circle? The first stitch in the basket wound upward like currents cutting through stones. The historical pages of time told on the tongues of an ancients born out of darkness with the promise of life in a circle. The color of one's ebony eyes reflecting sun of all seasons. The touch of wind on the face of midnight and dawn cracking with new birth and the always belief in its arrival and the promise of moon, midnight wind on the leaves, on eyelids, morning's moisture on tongues. How could anyone misspeak of beginnings? Stitch folded around every breath. To breathe is to believe in tomorrow. Untitled, what utterance could call us together in reverence of each other's existence? The placement of time and space of our lives pushes from the beginnings. Where do you come from? The questions asked. My mother, they replied, and before her, the questions asked her mother, her father, and where did they come? The questions asked their parents. Are you, are you something more than bloodlines strewn across dusk? One of my many grandfathers was a headman at Polga, held the bear, sang spring awake. Where the heck is Polga? The question asked, up canyon, Feather River country. But my beginnings go farther back than that. World maker, coyote, prince in a circle, a place made for us and us for that place, up river and down and back. The question becomes proclamation, yes, but somewhere way back you came across ice and eventually walked down to what became California, America, a response demanded. No, I say, no, we were placed destined to stand at river's edge, mountain trails from the beginning, first stitch in the circle. I'm gonna finish with an old poem. I would have been called a moon worshiper. Oh moon, my friend, thank you for always being there, a thin bone shoulder shadowed circle, nearly closed eyelid. You offer comfort when comfort is needed. Through cloud cover, marine layer, you always come through. Cradle me in your thin arms. Cleanse me in the pond of your full self to birth light while waiting on darkness. I have cried on your shoulders many times, your mirror embracing all of me. Thank you for your enduring friendship, your beauty through oak, redwood, pine, your midnight gleam off any river, your snowy grin. Oh, moon, you could never be my lover. Not that I don't ache for your white bone presence. And though you lift and release me with your rising and receding, such intimacy, with whom I have prayed to, would undress skin, flesh, and bone, my marrow too naked to distinguish itself from you, my friend, fleck of gold, summer's ice, pocked granite. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Thank you, Linda, that was great. So um, our final poet in the Native Poets part of the program tonight is Kim Shuck. 
Kim was San Francisco's seventh poet laureate from 2017 to 2020. Her latest books are Whose Water from Mammoth Publications and Deer Trails from City Lights. She is a Cherokee and Polish American poet, author, weaver, and beadwork artist who draws from Southeastern Native American culture and tradition, as well as from contemporary, contemporary urban Indian life. She is a member of the Cherokee Nation of Oklahoma, and her many awards include the Diane DeCora First Book Award from the Native Writers Circle of the Americas, an Academy of American Poets National Laureate Fellowship, and a Northern California Book Reviewers Groundbreaker Award. I'll add that she beaded the beautiful California green sturgeon on the cover of Red Indian Road West. Welcome, Kim. Hey folks, you know you're in the right poetry reading where you owe one person a phone call and you wanted to tell another one that we moved everything off of the guest bed and you need to come visit. Um, yeah, I wanted to say a couple of, first of all, uh, it's always a privilege to read in Ohlone territory. Um, also, I wanted to say something about um, when Lucy was reading her poem about place names, I was gonna mention that Oklahoma um, in context means uh, good red earth, but that's only, she's not wrong because that happens because we tend to call ourselves the name of the place where we're at. So the name all, often means the people and the place, which is a really different way of thinking about territory. And I think it's important, particularly here on Earth Day. Um, anyway, I wanted to share a new baby poem, we need to be a little careful with this one, it's Fontanelle is still soft. I love the every direction power word spit cold into the face of this always storm. But I can't afford the cry song, the next cry song, something that curled up around the dust he kicked when he evoked us and then declared us gone. I'm not gone. The young man asked me if the rock I carry in my heart the one handed over with the lineage back to initial invasion, the one with a chain attached that threads through continued occupation, the one that's hooked to every disappeared relative, every murdered bone of every uninvestigated someone's child. Does your rock get too heavy, auntie? He asked. Yes, it gets too heavy. Just now when someone who should be an ally declares us gone, in eloquent and delicious words, and I think for a second that maybe we are, but catch myself, my aging and practice balance asserts itself, and I remember, nephew, that rock gets heavy, and to carry it, I have to cut other things away so that you don't have to shoulder my share. Uh, we're going to dig back into the dark of history and some older poems. This one's called Bridges and Crossroads. WPA bridge over the Neosho. I stood on it in full flood with my dad, the water just kissing the underside of the boards, the river moans shivering up my legs. It stood until a flood licked out the footings. They replaced it. But when I dream the Neosho, the old bridge is there. They took the zinc out until they hit the daylight of Third Street. You could see the crack in the pavement. It looked like another pothole, and there was sunlight in the mine. Sunlight just there with the dull ache of lead and the grim scowl of Jack. Those cotton mouths know some songs too. They know some fish songs. And once crossing Tar Creek Bridge, a grandma snake got hit by a pickup. And in her last breaths, we drove up on her there like a burning library, her songs falling away in curls, taken by updrafts like smoke prayers near the water. She looked me in the heart and whispered, just the one secret.
when the first four-legged frog cousin pulled herself out of the water, it wasn't rejection. Soft, wet skin called her back again and again. Blood, a contract with water, a promise in the cells, a rattle we pick up and hand on, a moaning song that arches and clenches to bring our babies cradled in water, a gift returned, a rattle we pick up and hand on, one generation to the next. Um, I was interviewed one time and somebody asked me why I wrote so much about water. I'll let you guess. <laughs> this one's called Walking Around Water. Our bodies are creeks that have slipped their banks. Walking around water, going to water. Grandma pulled crawfish from her foam white hair, laughed otter laughs. We find our level, fall in breathy verga, fall into floating. We are creeks who dance with the gator goddess. We dance to the drumming. We're flood water. We slipped our banks. Grandpa knew fish. Dad knows Dungeness and Bullhead. We roll pebbles until they tell us what they know. We're overflow, walking around water. Remember, we're water. We sing water, our young water. Stand with the water. Protect the water. Um... <laughs> I always baffle on Earth Days and Earth, um, this was earlier, when uh, I'm with other indigenous people who go, well, we all called it Mother Earth. In, in Aniwia tradition, we called it the Mother Fire, not Mother Earth. Earth was something else, but um, we, call, we called it the Mother Fire. Um, the thing that activates everything, really. Anyway, um, in northeastern Oklahoma, in the now condemned place my father's family is from, the flint comes in red, bright red. This is called redstone. What happens to the children of warrior families when they find themselves confronted with the fact of a spring full of apple blossoms and sleeping boys whose attendant cats drape like wisdom snakes and the wild rose sings something that might be about England. The early pinking houses on this hill whisper of light and controlling light and the angles it can reveal that make you smile into this morning might make you wanna be seen for your own self entire in some post-invasion moment when we're not expected to forge prehistoric personalities or excavate them from this quarry that can sometimes spit something as useful as flint and in such astounding colors too. I'm gonna finish if this PDF gives me the file. I'm gonna finish with um, what will be the last poem in my next um, collection. Um, tap dance, Kim, tap dance a little bit. All right, you know what? Instead of that, I'm gonna read this one. There's an old story about how uh, medicine came about. Uh, things to, the kind of medicine that heals illness, it's not the only kind of medicine. Um, human beings were behaving badly and all the other people got together to have a meeting to talk about what might be done to us to, to make us behave. And almost everybody thought we should be given diseases that were incurable and eventually we would all die. And the pine tree and the sunflower said, that's not fair. If we're going to create illness, we've got to create something that'll cure it. So pine trees and sunflowers are our natural allies. And this one's called sunflowers. Sunflowers arrive at the front door. They pick through my beads. They stare through them, whisper poems to the pines one word at a time. Because these days are short, every seed watches. And who knows what they're thinking? 
Generational affiliation, I find dried seeds in the toes of my shoes. Singing of dancing, of medicine. I find dried seeds every day closer to the creek. It's not patience, it's hunger. Thank you so much for inviting me. There are a lot of people I love in this room and I, you know, I love hearing you read. So thank you for having me. And thank you, Kim. And thank you so much to all of the readers. You, you were all terrific. And um, it's just, I'm, I'm really delighted that we could all read together tonight. And it's so appropriate to do so on Earth Day. So that's the, that's the end of the Native Poets part of the program. And now I will turn it back to John Curl. Oh, well, thank you so much. That's just uh, so, so uh, profound, healing, um, you know, just the, uh, and the pow powerful. And that's, this is just the, uh, the kind of poetry that, uh, that we expect from you and that, um, you know, that we're so, uh, uh, honored to to be a part of a uh, reading with you. So, uh, so Dave, Linda, Allison, Stephen, Danette, Kim, and Lucy. You know, uh, I, I really thank you from the bottom of my heart uh, for the uh, universe for the Revolutionary Poets Brigade. And uh, you know, we're um, you know we're all on the same page, and we're all um, uh, we're you know uh, moving forward together. And that's what you know. This is a this is a cultural struggle, and uh, you know I think that is um, uh, through poetry and through other forms of uh, of culture is how we how we change the world. And I think we're making, you know, we're making our contribution. And really, that's you know all we can make is our contribution. So and now we got the uh, the second half of the uh, of the evening, which is the uh, uh, some of the poets from the Revolutionary Poets Brigade. And um, we're going to start with uh, Scott Bird, who is the creator of May Bird, an ongoing work dedicated to holistic expression through poetry, art, and music. Scott. Thank you, John. And thanks, everybody who read. <clears throat> I am I'm moved. I was moved to tears. Thank you. And, uh, and I wanted to also say, too, that um, I'm originally from Ute territory in Western Colorado, and I was interested, Lucille, to learn um, the derivation of Utah. I was always taught that it was the Spanish word for Ute, Utah, Y-U-T-A. And so, but I like, I, I think that uh, yours is more accurate. I, I, I'm gonna have to take that one on. <laughs> this poem I wrote <clears throat> for my grandmother, Linda, uh, it was her birthday last week. This is a portrait of a grandmother's visit. How lovely it is this day to be visited on the day of your birth as a poppy shedding its husk hat and rusty grapefruit petals open to the glow of your would-be 67th sun trip. You now nine years gone and counting. But what an azure day to find you by the first budding yellow rose of spring in flint whispers, the hum of a small iridescent bird feeding on red nasturtium nectar. A tiger swallowtail adorning the smile lines, the grief tracks of time's passage along canyons of face eyes a deep well of belonging wind. I brushed your silver streams and smile of freshwater spring while you wear the sky around your neck, pooling in lake water hoops. You carry the sun breathing rocks on your shoulders and forehead. It is a day for 13 lichen tolls, one for each hour of this day, one for each seat at the council of grandmothers, you now say, as Hermes and Raven told me, of a night of that intergalactic council of light to follow the roses and find what it is you're looking for on the sacred run through meadows of sleek hair on the arms and legs. A black earth, a white feather, a red sun, a yellow stone burning. Thank you.
You're muted, John. I'm here telling other people, <laughs> but not doing it myself. So, uh, Christina Brown is a poet, painter, and writer who grew up in Japan and has lived most of her adult life in San Francisco and is a longtime activist in the Bay Area. She often writes about what people will and won't do for love. Christina? Where is Christine? Christina? Unmute. Un unmute. Thank you, John, for making this possible and for your heads up on my failure to unmute when I should have realized it. Um, I just want to thank you for making this possible and thank everyone um, for being here. I'm going to read um, two short pieces. Wild in two parts. One, wild, wild boars, little wild boars on the streets of a city by the sea. Whole families, the camouflage coats of the piglets are so cute. Like flames, stripes of chestnut and yellow and tan run down their backs. They look like chipmunks with long legs in black point shoes. They roam in the ravines that cross the city and the streets and yards too. Too. They eat all the loose garbage, but not everyone is happy. They don't think wild animals should run in the streets. Fortunately, most of their fellow citizens disagree. Some of the animal lovers feed the boars by hand. All the lovers protect the bristly, four-legged ballerinas. And second, flower. In the dim twilight, the scent of the white lilies calls us. The flyers and the levitators the slim ones, life with flex, and our liminal brethren, the floaters on the breeze in iridescent bubbles. The star lilies say, come, make love with us. Be deep in ecstasy, intoxicated by our sweetness. The wind in the leaves whispers secrets mysteries, sings to us, weaves an arabesque among the boulders. The murmuring stream leads us onward, higher. The rising moon is bright, dapples the forest floor with silver, lights up the night for our big eyes. In the grove when I arrive, surrounded by perfume, the first of us are here before me. Lounge on huge freckled white petals and dark green leaves, lean against giant fluorescent green pistols, stroke the orange heads of stamens, smear golden shining powder on the centers of lilies, on themselves, on each other, on me. Our skin is soft, electric. I, we, breathe deeply, swoon with delight, feel the simultaneous beat of all of our hearts, the energy of the earth, rising, flowing through the lilies, through us all. We all glow, move, twist, 
leap, sway, dance together, make complex patterns of embrace and release. Oh, thank you so much, Christina. That's great. Thank you. Uh, Bobby Coleman is a lawyer poet who also sings the songs of Leonard Cohen in the Conspiracy of Beards chorus. Well, I almost recognize that introduction, but that's my fault for not supplying a, a different one. Thank you, John. Appreciate it. Um, no, I don't want to listen to that guy, though. Anyway, um, here I am. And uh, yes, we're on Ramatush, uh, Ohlone land, but also I am near the original village, let me get the name right, of a Muktak. And it occurs to me that right under this building flow the streams that were the lifeblood of those people. I was born in the town of Merrick, which comes from Meroki, the Algonquin word for oyster beds. That is now the town of Merrick, New York. The poem I'm going to read is translated from the French by Lawrence Berlinghetti. It's a poem by Jacques Prévert titled Pour faire le portrait d'un oiseau. It appeared in the um, book, the anthology, Feather Floating on the Water, Poems for Our Children, an anthology of contemporary San Francisco poets. To paint the portrait of a bird, First paint a cage with an open door, then paint something pretty, something simple, something beautiful, something useful for the bird. Then place the canvas against a tree in a garden, in a wood, or in a forest, hide behind the tree without speaking, without moving. Sometimes the bird comes quickly, but he can just as well spend long years before deciding. Don't get discouraged. Wait, wait years if necessary. The swiftness or slowness of the coming of the bird having no rapport with the success of the picture. When the bird comes, if he comes, observe the most profound silence. Wait till the bird enters the cage. And when he has entered, gently close the door with a brush, then paint out all the bars one by one, taking care not to touch any of the feathers of the bird. Then paint the portrait of the tree, choosing the most beautiful of its branches for the bird. Paint also the green foliage and the wind's freshness the dust of the sun and the noise of insects in the summer heat, and then wait for the bird to decide to sing. If the bird doesn't sing, it's a bad sign, a sign that the painting is bad. But if he sings, it's a good sign, a sign that you can sign. So then, so very gently, you pull out one of the feathers of the bird very gently, and you write your name in a corner of the picture. That translation is uh, from our 
late beloved Lawrence Berlinghetti. Thank you. Thank you, Bobby. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, Jack Hirschman, poet laureate emeritus of San Francisco, translator from many languages and author of The Arcanes. He's one of the editors of the upcoming anthology, Building Socialism, Fighting Fascism. And he works with the League of Revolutionaries for a New America. Jack Hirschman. Unmute, Jack. Me. Forgive me uh, again. I, I really appreciate being here with you all and hearing your wonderful poetry. I'm going to read just a couple of short poems. Last year, I lost a friend who lived in Yorkshire, England. His name is George Guest. Now, George Guest or George Guest is the name of the illiterate genius, American genius of the Cherokee people. Uh, I wrote a poem for George Guest, my friend, but it's also filled with George Guest. In memoriam, George Guest. On your birthday, George Guest. A few days after you passed away, how can a giant sequoia not be beginning to grow in the woods where you will be buried? You, who the same name as that creator of the syllabary of the Cherokee people, as you've given brilliant voice to the people of Yorkshire with your paintings, grow tall in death, George Guest, with your always deep wit and humor of what is wisdom's highest, most glorious sky. And this short poem, The Birds, I open my throat and your eyes are inside it for all to see. Like birds a chirp or asleep, a smile or on the wing in the round womb of a sound. They are the sound people say I make. People say, look, He's moaning or raging again. I say, look deeper. I've eaten soul whole. Her eyes are inside me. They see through me. They see me through. That's why I cry nests of light into the ear. Thank you. Thank you, Jack. Uh, Karen Melander Magoon has published two books against the backdrop of the pandemic, Year of Anguish, Time for Miracles, and The Earth Turns and has work in many anthologies and online publications. She's also a musician, minister, and a lover of grandsons, birds, and hiking in the wilderness. Karen Melanda Magoon. <laughs> um, Thank you, John. Thank you, John, for including a poetry. Um, Oh, I'm, I'm unmuted. Are you not hearing me? Yes, it's fine. It, I'm unmuted. Are you, is it okay now? And thank you to the Ohlone, to the late Yelanu, the Miwok, to all who have gone before and should be here now. Um, I have a couple poems on betrayal and the rest on tenderness. So this is shuffling ghost dance, calling for the bison and the spirits of ancestors to return, return to family, return to peace, return. 
to the circle. Cherish the land, shuffling ghost dance, soon to dance the place on. A deaf man protects his rifle, the military would steal when it goes off. The man. Karen, I suggested you turn off your video. Begins. Women and children on his. Oh, really? This is. Okay. Karen, we're having trouble um, with, with your sound. Why don't you start over again? Okay, turn I turn off. off okay, turn off. Tr try it without I your. I turned video. off the video. Is it better now? It's better now. Yes. Or is it, maybe I'm I'm scooting up closer to the microphone. Yeah, you're you're fine. Shuffling now. Ghost. Okay, shuffling ghost dance, calling for the bison and the spirits of ancestors to return, return to family, return to peace, return to the Lakota circle, cherish the land. Shuffling ghost dance, soon to be the dance of new ghosts massacred by U.S. military, fearful of the dance of the Lakotas, the dance for peace and the return of their ancestors and their bison. A deaf man protects his rifle the military would steal. When it goes off, the massacre begins. Women and children are not spared. A baby nurses on his dead mother's body. The U.S. military spare no one. Perhaps 100 of the 350 gathered are killed. The number matters little. The bodies could not be retrieved as easily as the winter cold froze them. A massacre frozen in place. Shuffling ghosts care little about apologies from Congress as their land continues to be raped by pipelines and white dominion. Their waters contaminated by US incursions, oblivious of treaties, oblivious of massacres, the blood of the native continues to flow through cracks in the land owned by no one but the great spirit. That is, of course, is a remembrance of Wounded Knee 1890 and a recurrence of abuse. I am going to read now um, enough of, I was going to read of the betrayal of the Wapanoa, but I am going to read Tenderness is a Bridge. Tenderness is a Bridge a span from here to here, from heart to heart, from mind to thought, girded with steel so gentleness may find its way, swinging on solid struts. Tenderness is a river flowing from here to here, from spirit to soul, from idea to embrace, sweeping under rock, resting among mangroves, playing with fiddler crabs on its way to the sea. Tenderness is the sea, rocked by the wind, churning in the primal surf of lost consciousness, luminescent in the sun's delicate first rays, or radiant in its evening glory, following the path from here to here across a glass fabric leading to eternity. Thank you, thank you. Um, if there is time, I have one more, but otherwise it's okay. This is called uh, Escape into Forever. Should I continue or not? Um, is, it, is it very short? Well, it's, it's about the same size. That's fine. It's okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, Sarah Menifee is an activist for the homeless, journalist with the People's Tribune. Her collection Cement was published by Swimming with Elephants Publications. And her collection Human Star was published in Italy, translated by Raffaella Marzano. Sarah Menifee. Yes, hi, I'm very honored to be part of this beautiful chorus of voices. I feel like it's rising from the earth itself. Um, uh, this morning there was a, or at noon today at City Hall, there was a press conference for the people who are fighting against the poisoning of the poor people of Hunters Point and Treasure Island. Um, so 
you know, I came home and I said, what do I want to read? I want to read um, from this little book, which I got about 50 years ago in a mm -hmm. drugstore in Reno, Nevada, where I'm from. That's Paiute and Washoe land. I came here to Ohlone land, um, but I, anyway, um, these are translations from songs and poems from, from different tribes from this continent. Um, so I'm going to um, read something called from the Winnebago called This Newly Created World. Pleasant it looked, this newly created world, along the entire length and breadth of the earth, our grandmother extended the green reflection of her covering and the escaping odors were pleasant to inhale. This is um, from the Aztec songs of birds. In time of rain, I come. I can sing among the flowers. I utter my song. My heart is glad. Water of flowers foams over the earth. My heart is intoxicated. Oh, um, the third short thing I want to read uh, is from the Paiute. I worked with Paiute people. I have friends there in the Great Basin and the Sage, in the Sage Country. Um, this is from a. Uh, this is songs of the ghost dance, and you know what that is. So, um. the wind stirs the willows. The wind stirs the willows. The wind stirs the grasses. The wind stirs the grasses. Fog, fog, lightning, lightning, whirlwind, whirlwind. The whirlwind, the whirlwind. The snowy earth comes gliding. The snowy earth comes gliding. There is dust from the whirlwind. There is dust from the whirlwind. The whirlwind on the mountain. The whirlwind on the mountain. The rocks are singing. The rocks are singing. They are ringing in the mountains. They are ringing in the mountains. Thank you. And thank you, Sarah. Now, Dorothy Payne is a poet and a painter who recently taught for two years in Guinea, Africa. Her poetry has been published in numerous anthologies and her most recent book is Birthmarks. It's Dorothy Payne. Thank you, John. Uh I'm getting a little sad, so if, if it's staticky on your end, I'll turn off the, the video. Can you hear me okay? It's, a, it's, it's echoey. It's, it's echoey. It's, I think you need to turn off the video. Uh, uh, I'll turn the video then. It's, it's doing the See same. See if that makes thing. sense. Yeah. yeah. Try that. Is that better? I turned off the video. Is That's, that better? That's an improvement. That's an improvement. Okay. Uh, I would like to sincerely thank the indigenous leaders who met today. I am a strong believer in the fact that the land has memory. I grew up 50 miles from the Mississippi River. I live near on the Mississippi River. But that means I grew up 50 miles from Keokuk. Uh, uh, my son lived in Pontusuk. Um, and and the legacy of uh, you 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 went out, uh, Dottie. Uh, try try it again. She's muted. Oh, Dottie, Dottie, we can't hear you. Unmute, please. Dottie. Okay. Yeah, it okay. keeps slipping Got into muting. I'm sorry. Okay. So right. Can you hear me now? Now we can still hear you. Kind of just you can start over again. Go ahead. 
Okay, well, I, I, I won't, I won't go on too long. I just wanted to thank you because I grew up near Keokuk, Iowa, Pontusic, Illinois. Uh, I believe the land has memory, and it was a part of my life. But it was not until I was a grown adult that I learned that my maternal ancestry was Seneca and Jewish, and my paternal ancestry was Cherokee and French. So. I feel grateful to to hear the voices of people who can remind me of who some of my original ancestors were. Uh, like Kim Shook, I often write about water, so I chose a poem for that relates to that. And again, probably because of the nearness of the Mississippi River in my lifetime and currently. Hip deep and hanging on. We're hip deep and hanging on and reaching against us. We've known these waters for so long, waded, swum these streams and hung on for dear life. Our grandmothers taught us how to hold the oars and guide the bow, how to navigate currents of hate, created an ecology of love, the real survival of the fittest. The preservation of the least of us, of the need to dive deep and stay long, taught us the water songs. And our grandfathers gave us impenetrable boots of steel and hand-tied nets, taught us the art of swinging them, of never taking more than we need, readied us for the long haul, because these waters are ours and always have been. Our Nile, our Amazon, our Mississippi dreaming, even when we were but tiny streams. Depth does not deter us. Our fins are not even edible. Our at home on the soft, muddy floor have been for so long that we have scored and rescored them, made maps of them. The dolphins are our friends. The whales share the seas with us, allow us to ride them high tide us so we can see the atrocities, show us how to outrun the lesser ones who kill at will. We are capable of holding our breath for a very long time. Poverty has made us practice this. We can withstand the chill of unfriendly waters. Class hatred has made us practice this. We can ignore their unkind stares because we always had to endure them. We are unafraid because they no longer even realize us. We are the oceans, the fish in mass below, the bottom feeders they call us. We say we are the world they cannot see because they believe we're so far beneath them. The ocean floors they saturate with filth and plastic. The earth they frack, the zoetic world they annihilate without a blink is our home. We them freely because they no longer believe we exist, no longer hear our siren songs, no longer heed Poseidon's warnings. They have lost their bearings, their ability to dive deep, their ability to guide with their own eyes. They are the unbelieving Ulysses, the ones who can never return home as long as we navigate these seas. Breathe deeply and quietly beneath them. Stay strong until dawn. Thank you. Very powerful, Dottie. <laughs> Gregory Pond has published four volumes of poetry. He is a facilitator of Poetically Speaking, a weekly conference call program for seniors. And his recent books are 4 a.m. Light and 4 a.m. Dark. Wonderful books, check them out. Thank you. Thank you, John. And thank 
Thank you all poets, native poets, and non-native poets. When they came. When they said they discovered what already belonged to others. When they came to lay claim in their mother country's name. Explorers cross the seas to seize, exploit, and plunder, then torture, kill, or capture those they chose not to rape. When settlers first arrived, they planned to extract the natural from selected trees, rivers, and mines. So they confiscated precious resources from mountains, ground, and skies justified their acts with Bible and gun, then began to colonize. Using terror to whomever wouldn't surrender, with deceit, cheating, and lies, they led massacres over occupied spaces where millions of innocent died. They desecrated sacred culture, left a trail of tears, a pile of bones, a circle of vultures. Their arrogance on full display, they now routinely pave paradise to put parking lots and condos on top of indigenous graves. Then as forms of slow genocide, they continue to dehumanize, marginalize, and treat native nations as prey. Not only have they kicked dirt over centuries of hurt. But what's even worse, they've so skillfully twisted facts that they now come to believe that they've always owned this native land they've stolen as they try to hide their blood-stained tracks. Thank you. Wow. Thank you. Great. It's one of our features tomorrow at La Palabra, no, it's Saturday at La Palabra Musical. Come and check him out. Oh, thank you so much, Greg. What, a, what an incredible evening of poetry. Um, and that gets us into, uh, into, into myself. So I will uh, finish with a poem. And then uh, I, think, uh, I think Lucy has arranged for uh, to, um, uh, to end the evening with, um, uh, with, with, a, with a, a song. So. Um, uh, so, traditions of alienation. When I was quite young, I had an uneasy feeling that something very basic was not right in the world around me. I didn't have a word for it then. Now I know it's called alienation. Free floating alienation is so ubiquitously suffocating in this society that it just seems like background noise. Generations of great physicians, shamans, and philosophers have debated the causes of this profound alienation and remedies for it. The vulture's share of causes can be summed up in the word capitalism. But I know that is far from the whole picture. We've got lots of biological hardwiring and destructive traditions to reckon with. I've always looked at traditions with skeptical eyes. I didn't grow up in a traditional family and have never been a traditional person myself, except in the traditions of the struggle for social revolution and environmental justice. But with life experience, I've come to understand the many values of traditions beside the many obstacles they can present. In modern mass society, a person's self-worth is tied primarily to material accomplishments. In contrast, in a traditional society, Self-worth can be tied to practicing traditions and following a traditional way of life. 
this offers a sense of well being that comes from feeling securely in harmony with the universe. And so traditional people cling tenaciously to their ancient ways. Native people have always walked in the footsteps of their ancestors for guidance because those ancestors practiced and understood the, the life nourishing ways that guided their people through countless dangers in harmony with our precious mother earth. We all have ancestors who practiced good ways of living. We may not know all their names, but we know they existed because otherwise none of us would have survived from the shadows of time until now. With these healing thoughts, we honor them and all traditional people, caretakers of the natural world. And we look to them to guide us into the future along this perilous winding way. Thank you. And uh, I'll give it back to, uh, to Lucille to finish the evening. Well, thank you very much. And I want to say thank you to John Curl and the Revolutionary Poets Brigade for sponsoring this reading tonight. And I'll also say thank you to all of the poets who read. It's, it's really been a terrific evening. Um, and now, Dave Holt will close for us with a song. Yeah, this... Uh... This is a warrior song. It comes from Rosebud Reservation. <clears throat> warrior sometimes means something a little different than you might expect. It's kind of like when I got to know you revolutionary guys, I realized, oh, they're the kind of warrior I'm used to. Mm -hmm. And that's a warrior who protects the helpless, takes care of the weak, and lends their strength to that protective circle. our evening completes the circle and um you know that for the revolutionary poets brigade we, we thank you all for coming and uh you know it has been such a, a powerful and profound evening that it, it will be on um, uh, be on youtube and be on our uh, on our on our web page so if you have friends who missed it you can uh, tell them to check it out there and um you know hopefully uh we will, uh, we will see you next year. And uh, yes. thank you. Do it again. Thank you all. Thanks, everybody. Good night. Uh -huh.
Thank you. Good night. Thank you, John. Thank you, Lucy. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.